Hi everyone, we're back and the topic for discussion is the new nurse. This is part two of medical abbreviations. I'm just going to try to put it together nicely so that it makes it easier for you to understand rather than using it in a health of skeletal way, these abbreviations. A surfer hits his head on the pier. He sustains a subarachnoid hemorrhage. There is actually a short way of writing subarachnoid hemorrhage, SAH. The doctor placed an EVD and ordered ICP monitoring. He also ordered CPP and LOC, HOB up 30 degrees, and TCDs times three days, as well as NPO. Well, if all of this confuses you, I will very soon explain to you what each one means in a little more detail. And by the way, you may not be aware that the brain injured patient is at risk for seizures because of the brain injury. There are videos that will give you more information on that if you take a look at sessions. I'm not really sure which one, but there is one on seizures. Anyhow, here are what these abbreviations will stand for. TBI, traumatic brain injury, EVD, external ventricular device, and that's the device that's placed in the ventricle so that the, the excess CSF can be drained out, blood CSF that accumulates can be drained out. Head of bed up 30 degrees is HOB. LOC would be level of consciousness. CPP, cerebral perfusion pressure, and that is usually measured by taking the MAP, the mean arterial pressure, and minusing it from the ICP, the which is the intracranial pressure, whatever number you comes up. And that actually references the amount of circulating, the blood perfusing to the brain. TCD, that's transcranial Doppler ultrasound, TCDs. At times when patients have brain injuries like a subarachnoid hemorrhage, the doctor will order it to be done two or three days in a row or so to see exactly what is going on as far as the brain getting enough blood. NPO, nothing by mouth. Some people would say nothing per orally or nothing per OS, but it means nothing by out mouth. Now, transcranial Doppler ultrasound is done to assess any decrease in arterial blood flow to the brain. And from my own experience, I've seen it done after patients have had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, the doctor would probably order it for like three days in a row or so, so that he can assess um, what is called vasospasm, if there is any such thing, which is usually brought on by a decrease in blood flow to the brain. And there is um, a wonderful case study on dearnurses.com of a subarachnoid hemorrhage that will help you understand more. And one thing we ought to be concerned about is that when patients visit, sometimes they complain that, you know, patient and family education, that should not be overlooked. Nobody's communicating with them. And then I referenced a DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis, and that's really very important because it can happen to a diabetic with type 1 diabetes. And um, there is a case study also that you can see at dearnurses.com. It's uh, Diabetic Care for Nurses in the Clinical Setting, Volume 1, page 12. I'm going to just touch down on cerebral edema, which is caused by swelling on the brain as fluid accumulates in the brain and the intracranial pressure rises. Um, I've seen people get, I've had it myself when you go to altitudes in particular, some people have a very difficult time at high altitudes and develop cerebral edema. You can also, patients can also get it, brain injured patients causes the ICP to rise and they get severe headaches, nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath and fatigue. And it can, may even result in a seizure. And all, uh, some of the causes of cere um, cerebral edema include high altitude brain injuries such as a hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, which references SAH, a brain tumor or a cardiac arrest. And there is a case study on ICP monitoring and meningitis, which can give you more information at dearnurses.com. I hope you have benefited from this. Until next time, have a great weekend because we're on to July the 4th coming up this weekend. Goodbye to all.